We are ecclesia. We are church. Today I want to share a, a message with you. As Ashley, it's going to be a, a series of messages with you over the next six to eight weeks. We're going to be going through what is church. Um, this, this sermon series has been on my heart for about 12 years. It came to me probably in my first seminary class. I had a, a new young seminary professor. He had just graduated with his Ph.D., and he had just uh, began teaching. I was one of his first students, and he uh, set us down and started going over some disturbing trends that were happening throughout America that he had uh, done his Ph.D. and doctoral work on. And some of the trends that he was seeing is uh, in the United States, we are closing more churches than churches are opening. So more ch uh, churches are closing their doors than new churches are being planted. So that's a disturbing trend. He also st started revealing in his research that in that time that there's been less ministers fulfilling the call to ministry. That there's a downward trend in ministers and that eventually, even with the, the doors closing, there still won't be in a 10 to 15 years enough ministers to fill all the pulpits that need to be filled. That's a disturbing trend. I sat down with our Brevard uh, Baptist Association uh, Director of Mission. His name is Mike Hoffman. This about two weeks ago and ate lunch with him, and he reaffirmed that these trends are continuing. In our county right now, there are 30 churches that he deems that are in the red, meaning they're this close to closing their doors. Why? In this class, our professor looked at us, all potential ministers, about 60 of us, and he asked us this very important question. He goes, what is church? And we began to just unlock the scriptures, and we just said we were going to throw out all ideas, all preconceptions that we had, and let's just take God's word, let's just take the New Testament, let's just read what it says and let it speak to us. And that's where this series began in me. And that was about 2012, I mean 2007, 12 years ago. I'm a big football fan. Many of you guys know that, Roll Tide. That. <laughs> and in football, I know playing the game as well as watching the game and being a fan of the game, there's something that you can find out from teams that are really good and teams that are really bad. And they have some commonalities that really good teams and really bad teams all have to do some very similar things, but the very good teams do the basic things really, really well. A really good football team will throw the ball good. They'll kick the ball good. They'll tackle people good. Those are the three basic things. Throw, pitch, tackle, block, and kick. Now, when you watch a football game, you see there's a lot much more going on in the game. But the teams that are very good know how to do the very basic things very well. And the teams that struggle, if you watch a very bad football team, You'll see them struggling in blocking. You'll see them struggling in tackling. You'll see them struggling kick the ball. The very basics. You'll hear the coach at the end of the year or at the end of a game saying, you know what, we can't do anything right. We need to get back to the basics. Once we learn to do the basics right, then we can start being a better team and start working on these other things, but right now we can't even do the basic things right. 
You'll hear that over and over from a coach that's struggling. Well, church, the church in Western society is struggling. And I believe the reason why we're struggling is we have done a lot of programs, we've done a lot of big and and fancy things, but we've lost and we've neglected some of the basics. And so this morning what I'm hoping to do is, as we start this series on Ecclesia, is build upon the basics. What is the basic? What is the bare necessity? What is the bare essentials of being church? Ecclesia. That is the word that Jesus used to describe the church. This word, ecclesia, was not invented by Jesus. Jesus didn't invent the word. He's using a word that came in existence about 600 years before him. It came from Athens, Greece. It's a Greek word called ecclesia, and it was used to create a new group of people that's going to take power away from, from powerful people and give it to the common person. These people, these called out ones, is what the word ecclesia means, and it's going to be these people who were called out to give power back to the people from the powerful. We're going to learn how that came into existence. Before we do that, I want you to know our main text this morning is going to be Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. We have some secondary texts we'll be going through as well. They're up there for you as well. Some background on this word. I believe words have meaning. Words begin somewhere. Historical context helps us understand origins of words and their meaning. The word ecclesia did not begin in the New Testament. The word is translated into the English as church. This word originated around 500 B.C. by a Greek lawmaker named Solon. This would have been about the same time in biblical history as the time of Daniel. Ezekiel and Jeremiah. This guy Solon was living in Athens, Greece. He was an Athenian statesman, a lawmaker, a poet, who was credited with restructuring the social and political organization of Athens and thereby laying the foundations for Athenian democracy. So Solon found himself in a very particular spot in his time and in his life. He was appointed by two kings, two Athenian kings, to to help bring peace between the common people and the aristocrats. He was called to become the peacemaker or moderator between two groups that were uh, at odds with one another. These aristocrats, there were eight families during this time in Athens that had controlled all the land. They had taken the land from the common person, and now they controlled it all. And with that type of control, they started using their power to gain influence and also to take advantage of the common person. So if you had a, place, a piece of land that you had lived on, these aristocrats came in and took it from you. And then you still lived there and you still yielded all the work and all the labor and all the crops that came from that land. And then they would come and take whatever measure they wanted from the people. As you can imagine, that didn't make the common person too happy. They're doing all the work, doing all the the, uh, heavy carrying, and these aristocrats are just coming in and taking what they want from them. Solon was tasked with the reconciliation of this problem and then to find a solution. The people who lived and worked the land were constantly having to pay higher percentages of their yield. Tensions were high, and Solon was given the task of mediator and to find a solution for the country. 
Solon first proposed to cancel all debts, and this was called the shaking of burdens. With the cancellation of debts, people would then be allowed to purchase the land they lived on and have sole rights to such land. He then proposed that no person could be used as collateral to secure loans to purchase land. Unsurprisingly, the rich aristocrats of Athens did not take too kindly to Solon's reforms either. Disputes over high appointments blighted politics, and the tyrant Pisistrus seized power three times in the 550s and in the 540s B.C. Nevertheless, Solon did reduce the dominance of Athenian aristocracy and improved the participation of ordinary citizens in the political arena. In this, he deserves credit for laying the foundations for Athenian democracy, which would arrive in the mid to 5th century B.C. Solon's proposals would soon bring the power of the country away from a select few and bring power back to the people. Evidence seems to indicate that by the 7th century, all free-born adult male citizens of Athens had the right to attend open meetings in a body called the Assembly, or Ecclesia, which elected nine magistrates called archons, which are rulers, each year. These archons, still are aristocrats in this early period, headed the government and rendered verdicts in disputes and criminal accusations. So here's the first time we see this word come out. Solon proposes that these common people, these common men, need to have a voice, need to be represented in the government. And he would call an assembly of all free citizens. Those assembly of free people would be called ecclesia, the church. And they were going to represent the power, I mean the, the powerless, the common person, against the hierarchy or the aristocrats. This is why this word is important, because Jesus chooses to use this same word for the people that he's going to call to follow him. This is the people that are going to be called to be the church. Ecclesia was an assembly of people called out to bring a power balance between those who ruled and the normal citizens. We live in a time now, as we're going to look at this as, as from a, a spiritual standpoint, where Satan is the aristocrat, Satan is the tyrant. He has claimed the earth, and, and uh, Jesus is going to appoint the church, the assembly of people, to come and represent the average person and bring back power to the people. Ecclesia was never about a building. It was never about a location but about a people to bring balance to corruption. To hold the powerful accountable and to fight for the common person. Jesus in this passage of scripture is going to use the word ecclesia to describe the people he was going to assemble on the earth. This people is where he uses the word, this passage is where he uses the word church for the first time. The word ecclesia is used here. To describe his people. As we get into the text this morning. I want you to have that concept. That imagery in your mind. That we are a people. That God is going to call out to use. To bring back order on an earth. That has been, been taken over. By a tyrant. Let's see how that applies in this passage of Scripture, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, 
For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. The first thing I want us to understand this morning is that the church begins with a question. The church begins with the question. We need to understand some history about this passage. Here, Jesus is taking his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. It was a city that was kind of going through some of its own struggle and turmoil. What had happened about this time when Jesus was walking was this city, Caesarea Philippi, used to be called Panaeus or Panaeus. And that city was called Panaeus or Panaeus because they worshipped the Greek mythological god called Pan. He was the god of wild things. He was the god of the, the, the wild animals and, and the god of the woods. The god that would protect or allow safe travel or passage as people traveled and walked and did things in, in uh, uh, that part of the world. He wasn't one of the, the, the higher gods in the mythological structure, but he was the most referenced god in Greek mythology. So he was an important figure to the Greeks. And that city was named after him because that's where they went to worship him. Well, guess what? Greece fell to the Romans. Rome took over and... It wasn't long that a governor by the name of Philip came, and it was about this time when Jesus was walking by that he said, I want to name this city after me. This city's no longer Panaeus or Panaeus. It's going to be called Caesarea Philippi. I'm going to name it after me. So can you imagine what the townsfolks were saying about this? Who is this guy? And what gives him the right to change the name of our city? And they were having these back and forth conversations, I'm sure, on the street as this was going on. And Jesus probably had overheard some of that discussion, or maybe the news had traveled and they had caught wind of this as they traveled through. And this conversation began to take place. And as they were talking about Philip, he stops the disciples on the way and he asks a question. Well, who do the people say that I am? You see, Jesus is going to start building the foundation for his people right here with this very question. It's a question that's going to ring true for Coastal Community Church. It rings true for Western Christian Church. It rings true for all the churches throughout all time. The church of God it is built on this question. It begins with this question. Who is Jesus? Who do we say he is? The disciples respond by saying, well, many think you're John the Baptist. Some think you are Jeremiah. Some think you are Elijah. Some just think you're just a great prophet. There were all good reasons for why they thought that. Elijah was thought by Jewish theologians that he would return one day. Jeremiah was the prophet that spoke to his own people but was rejected. And people were seeing the commonality between Jesus and Jeremiah speaking and being rejected by his own people. John the Baptist was one of the greatest teachers that walked and he had just lived the same time period as Jesus was uh, beheaded just two chapters before. (laughs) They saw it somehow thought maybe John the Baptist came back and, and somehow fixated himself into Jesus because he was a great teacher. The 
church begins with the question, who do you say Jesus is? We find that similar answer today in most of society. Well, he was a great man. He walked and lived a great life. He was a good prophet. He was a good teacher. He did some, some great social things in his life. What a great guy. But that's just the beginning of the question. That's just the beginning of the church. Jesus then transforms this from what the other people say about me. And then he looks at his disciples, his followers, right there in the eye. And he goes, but who do you say that I am? Read with me in verse 15. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. The church of God is going to be built on this confession. It's the confession that Jesus Christ is not a prophet, that Jesus Christ is is not just a good teacher, He's not built upon uh, Him being Elijah or Jeremiah or John the Baptist, The, the The church is built on the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. He is the Savior of the world. That's the confession in which the church is built. So the church begins with the question, the church is built on a confession. Read with me Romans 10, 8 and 9. But what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved from what? Our sins and from this domain of darkness that is currently present on this earth. And Jesus says it's based upon this confession that his people will be transferred from the domain of darkness to his marvelous light. It's based upon the confession of Christ. That is how the church is built. It's built on confession of who Jesus is. The church is built by Christ. Verse 17 and 18. God revealed the correct answer to Peter. Let's read that again. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God revealed the correct answer to Peter. Notice that. It wasn't that this came from Peter's on intuition. I find it interesting that, you know, Peter's one that will jump out first and and do things right. Right, Steve? You you mentioned that the other night. He is one that will... But guess what? Sometimes he finds himself getting in trouble doing that. But today, he got it right. But it was God's revelation to him that allowed him to confess this, make this confession. It was God affirming that this trait, this statement is true. Notice that Jesus says here, it's upon this I will build my church. A lot of times in uh, church history, which had some things go askew. The Catholic Church interpreted this, that, that Jesus was going to build his church based upon Peter and what Peter did. Therefore, the popes were then established that Peter was the first pope. But notice here in the text, notice here in verse 17 and 18, let's just go to 18, 
And I tell you, you are Peter, comma, and on this rock I will build my church. What rock? The rock was his confession, not his name. It was the confession that Peter gave, not the person of Peter. It was upon the confession that Jesus will build his church. Peter was going to be the one God was going to use in Acts chapter 2 and uh, chapter 3 to begin proclaiming the gospel and actually starting and launching his ministries. But it's not based upon Peter's starting and launching of his ministry. It's based upon the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. That's the church. Any person who proclaims Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God and believes in their heart and confesses that, they become a part of the church. Notice that this church is not Peter's or the disciples or anybody else's. It is Jesus' church. I will build my church. You see, Jesus is the head. Colossians 1, 17 through 19 says this, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Verse 18 there says, And he is the head of the body, the church. I could go on and on. There's other scriptures that affirm this. But listen, church, it's Jesus who is the head. He will build the church, and he builds it not upon any man. He builds it upon confession that he is the Son of God. So those that profess this confession, the church is being built. The next point is that Christ gives authority to this church, to this called out people that confess Jesus Christ. Verse 19, he gives the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom to the church. Let's read that. And I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build this church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I want to stop there. These keys to the kingdom. God is building this kingdom. He's building this people, these called out people, that are going to go and they're going to take over the earth. The earth that has been taken over by Satan. For some reason, God's allowed him to be the ruler of this world. We're going to get into that just momentarily. But he's letting the church know, he's going to let the people that confess him know that he's going to give them authority. And these keys, he said he's going to give to Peter, and he's going to give them to the church, and these keys represent authority. Keys unlock things. Keys change things. Keys represent authority and power. A lot of people take this as that the church must form some type of governmental system and we must rule the earth in like in some type of governmental way. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. This key to the kingdom in all my studies and all my research has pointed me to that the keys isn't about some type of hierarchy or some type of governmental church authority that takes over the earth. The keys is the gospel. And the gospel will go forth from its people and it will bind those dark things that need to be bound and it will loose those who need to be set free that respond and hear the gospel. And the church has been given the keys. They have been given the word of God. They've been given the gospel to go forth and unloose things. That is what these keys represent They're the keys to the kingdom so that people may be ushered in to the kingdom of God. 
And those keys are the gospel of Jesus Christ. You remember in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the very power of God. These keys represent power and authority, but the power is not to rule some church government rule over the land, but to present the gospel and let people be freed. You see, there's a tyrant on the earth that needs to be removed. We don't operate from a, a position of, of weakness, but a position of strength. The earth is to be infiltrated by the church and take away ground from this tyrant. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says this. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This, this God of this world, notice little g, is Satan, and he has blinded people, he has put veils over people's eyes, he is running amok, he is running around, stealing, killing, and trying to destroy families, destroy our, our, our planet, and trying to take as many people away from the kingdom of heaven as possible. The church is called to be the ones with the gospel, the keys to the kingdom, and go and take the blinders off. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Listen, your enemy is not your neighbor. Your enemy is not the Muslims. Your enemy is not the uh, people on the other side of the world that you don't understand or know. Your enemy is Satan. And he wants us to, uh, Jesus wants us to know that he's called a people, a called out people. He's assembling a group of people to set the captives free. And he does that. We do that through the gospel. Sometimes we misidentify our enemy and we get off track as a church and we fail to be his people and carry out our mission guys we get so caught up in some of these these political debates and these political things and it's it's farthest thing from God's mind he understands what's going on behind the scenes it is evil it's running uh, rampant and it's Satan behind it all and he's called us to be the light in the darkness will you be the light some practical application the church is an assembly of people that confess Christ as the Son of God and are now His representatives on earth. Church is not something that we go to on a weekly basis. Let me say it again. Church is not something we go to on a weekly basis. Church is something that we exist in 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Wherever we go as individual believers, the church is with us. Christ has given us authority to take back the earth from Satan and usher in the kingdom of God. Wherever you go, the church goes. Why? Because the king of the kingdom lives inside you. And wherever the king goes, the kingdom goes. Hear it here today, church. 
We exist not for Sunday mornings. We exist every day of our lives to go and let us be the representatives of Christ in this world. And wherever you go, you're taking the church with you. Second Corinthians 5.20 Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. We are to be ministers of reconciliation. We are to be ambassadors of Christ, His representatives on this earth. We have a tyrant, Satan, who is wild and free right now, but he has called us to bring it in check, to bring the power back to the common people through Jesus Christ. He uses this word in this passage, ecclesia, for us to be the called out ones, just as Solon envisioned in 560 B.C., a people to stand up against the all-powerful he calls us, we're going to be standing up against the same forces and he's going to be with us and he's going to empower us and he is going to use us to bring back order on this planet. Application. Be the church at home in your neighborhood. Be the church at work. Be the church wherever you go and whatever you do. It's built upon your confession. If you have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, you are a part of the church. And be his representative. Ecclesia. The called out ones. What is church? It's not a location. It's a people. Who go out into the earth and they represent Jesus Christ. Jesus and his disciples leave here after this discussion and notice that they don't go and to Caesarea Philippi and say, all right, we need to start Coastal Community Church in Caesarea Philippi. Let's go to Jerusalem and erect a building dedicated to Jesus here. Let's call it First Baptist Jerusalem. No. He tells them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. As you go, as you go out, be my representatives. Now, some of you are saying, well, what about what we're doing right now? Be patient. we got some more of the sermon series to go. But the basic principle is this. It's not about a location. It's about a people, and we are his representatives, and we represent the Son of the living God. And we go out to the earth, and we set the captives free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and we just thank you that you have given us, Lord, insight into this passage, Lord. We pray, God, that you would help us to be your ambassadors, just to be your representatives, that we would be your people. Lord, that we don't get caught up in all what this person does or that person does as far as, you know, uh, the, you know, the political agreements and disagreements. Lord, we just, we solely focus on your word. Help us to be people that take forth your gospel. Give us courage and boldness to, to be the ones who take the keys that you have given us, the, 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 the power that you have given us. And proclaim your good news through it. Lord, I pray that you would use this body of individuals this week to be ones who would release captives. That you would help them, Lord, bring about change in individuals' life. We pray against Satan. We pray against his schemes. 
the evil that's behind the scenes, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that we would be overcomers of that more than conquerors and that people would come to know you through the testimony and witness of your word through our lives as we live and be your church every day. God, give us that, that boldness. Lord, as we close today, I pray that if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you, Lord, that you would draw them to yourself. Help them to uh, see you for who you are, the Son of the living God that died on the cross for them. Help them, Lord. And Lord, as we close this service today, we pray that you would just receive honor from everything that's been saying, said and done here. May you leave here knowing that your people worshipped you and heard from you and praised you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.